That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be cleaned to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing, but it's for your own safety. A reclined seat is comfy for you, but it makes it harder for the passenger behind you to get out of their seat, which is crucial in case of an emergency. The lower tray table is the same way, only this time it's you who won't be able to stand up fast enough if anything happens. Besides, the tray table prevents you from assuming the secure position in the event of an emergency landing. This position requires you to bend over in your seat, put your head between your knees, and cover the back of your head with your hands. Imagine doing that while your tray table is open. If you look around the cabin, you'll notice little black or red triangles around the midsection of the plane. These stickers let the flight attendants know where the airplane wings are located so they can immediately look out the right window to see if something is amiss outside. You shouldn't lower the window shades while taking off, taxiing, or landing for two reasons. First, the flight attendants must always be able to monitor the situation outside, and open shades help them with that, obviously. Second, if something's gone wrong on board the plane while it's on the ground, for example, a fire, the ground crews won't be able to see it and evaluate the situation before going in unless the windows are open. That tiny hole you see at the bottom of any airplane window isn't there to scare you nuts. In fact, it helps keep the pressure from the inside and the outside of the window equalized. The hole itself is only made in the second layer of glass, and there are three of them overall, which also helps with security, by the way. Even if the outer glass breaks, there will still be two more to keep you safe. Now, you might see flight attendants touching the overhead compartments while they're walking along the aisle, but that's not exactly what they do. Right beneath the compartments, there's usually a handrail that goes all the way through the cabin. So you can also use this trick to stay firmer on your feet in the aisle. The pilots dim the lights in the cabin during nighttime not for you to get cozy and sleepy. Our eyes have a hard time adjusting to darkness in the first few minutes of sudden lights out. And in the case of emergency, every second matters. So the lights get dimmed to let you get used to darkness in case something happens and you have to act fast. Pay attention to the aisle floor, too. If there's an emergency landing at night, there will be two luminescent strips along the aisle showing you the way to the exit. Follow them to get safely out of the plane. Flight attendants also suggest counting the seats between you and the emergency exit once you're seated. This will help you navigate in case there's no other guidance available. If a lightning bolt hits the plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with aluminum coating that conducts electrical current and doesn't let it inside. This protection is tested using a lightning simulator. Airplane windows are round because the air pressure is evenly distributed this way. If the plane's windows were square, strong air currents would accumulate in the corners of the windows, depressurizing the cabin. 
and that's bad. Don't think you become untouchable if you go to the airplane toilet. The bathroom door can be opened from the outside. There's usually a small latch at the top of the door that allows cabin crew to get you out of there. It's useful for both getting to people doing something suspicious in the bathroom and helping those who don't feel well and, for example, collapsed while in the toilet. Yeah, let's avoid doing that. The plane's wings flash red and green lights at night to show the direction the plane is heading in. A green light is always on the right wing, and a red one is on the left. Aircraft tires are designed to withstand 4 to 5 times more pressure than they actually experience upon landing. The wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots always have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can still go well if one of the pilots has gone down because of a stale burrito, but not if it's both of them. And try not to both of you eat the fish. Some airlines don't allow pilots to have beards. Facial hair can prevent securely fitting the oxygen mask, and pilots must always remain conscious. The seats are blue in most aircraft because this color soothes people. It's also easy to keep clean. The rumbling noise you hear after boarding the plane is luggage being loaded on the plane. The compartment is right beneath the cabin, so it can sound quite loud sometimes. On most flights longer than 7 or 8 hours, pilots have access to a specially designed rest seat in or near the cockpit. Flight attendants typically have a section of the cabin reserved for them, and it's sometimes separated from the passenger areas. Some larger aircraft even feature private crew quarters above or below the main cabin. The wings of most passenger aircraft are located at the bottom of the plane. It's called a low wing. Firstly, if you install the engine under low wings, it'll be closer to the ground and easier to repair. Secondly, the wings will take on part of the shock in case of a hard landing. And if the plane falls into the water, then the wings become a life-saving pillow. By the way, a plane can stay afloat for 10 minutes to 60 hours. It all depends on the model of the plane, weather conditions, and pilot skills. Now, most airplanes are white because this color best reflects the sun rays and the aircraft body doesn't heat up as much. Also, the damage is best seen on white, and white paint is simply cheaper. Shoulder straps seem more secure than just a waist belt, but not in the case of planes. When the plane gets into turbulence, it's tossed a bit in the air. The waist belt will simply hold you in place in case of a more severe shake. Shoulder straps would require more space between the seats, and this is not justified on a plane. In a car, the impact is usually much stronger, so you need that shoulder strap not to whoosh through the windshield. Flight attendant seats do have passenger straps, but that's because they are much less comfortable than passenger ones. They're narrower and positioned facing the passengers. Flight attendants need extra protection simply not to fall off their seats if the plane shakes hard enough. Also, they have to help and direct people during potential evacuation. And for that, they need to be in top shape. Now, maybe you've noticed that you always enter the plane from its left side. Firstly, the captain usually sits on that side. This way, it's easier for the captain to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with the baggage on the right side. If passengers come from the left, the crew can do their job undisturbed. Want to catch a glimpse of what flying might look like in the future? Then you're in the right place! Economy class lie flat bunk beds, vertical flying vehicles, AI powered in flight meal service. Buckle up and let's start our flight. But first, I need to ask you have you ever heard of the Crystal Cabin Awards? Oh, those are like the Oscars of aviation interior design. And here are some of the most recent winners Meet Sky Nest, a lie flat bed for people traveling in economy class. These nests are supposed to be used on long-haul flights. The design is based on a sleep pod island located in the middle of the plane. And you can book a four-hour time slot.
if you want to take a real nap during your flight. The best news is that this design is likely to be introduced next year. While traveling in premium economy on long routes, you'll be able to use smarter seating design. It includes wider seats and twin armrests, which means no more fighting for space with your neighbors. Plus, there will be fully flexible rows with cushions that can be elevated, creating lie flat beds. Lufthansa Group has promised that premium passengers will be able to book suites with double beds and travel on temperature controllable heated or cooled seats. As you see, these days, airline companies are working hard on new designs of aircraft cabins, and it might impact the entire future of air travel. At the moment, they focus on travelers' experience within the walls of the plane. As a result, we have some mind boggling products. Check out Singapore Airlines First Class Suites or Air France's La Première cabin, which is believed to become one of the best first class cabins in the skies. It's going to feature suites equipped with separate sofas and chairs, and each suite will have five windows along the cabin wall. This will make it the longest first class suite in the world. But then, Airbus went and patented the idea of a more interactive flight experience, especially for those lucky passengers occupying window seats. With the help of special eye tracking equipment, the aircraft might be able to highlight significant objects you're looking at and provide you with detailed information, appearing on a semi transparent display on the window. The patent also claims that you could send data to devices connected by Bluetooth or Wi Fi. This way, Takeoffs and landings would get much more exciting, and you'd be able to get information about a new country or city. Qatar Airlines, in turn, came up with the idea of Q Suites. It looks like this. On the sides, you have individual suites, while the middle part can be transformed. You can choose to have a double suite to travel together with your partner, or you can have some private space. Or even move the walls and turn the place into a quad suite that you can use for a meeting. There might also be some improvements in economy class. They're bound to bring more comfort, especially on a long haul flight. A company called Zodiac Seats filed a patent based on a zigzag configuration of seats. Look at this aisle, which contains three and four seats, with each of them facing in the opposite direction. This allows for way more shoulder space than regular seating. Plus, passengers have a lot of leg space. Yes, some people might feel a bit uncomfortable having to face their neighbor for more than eight hours straight, but aren't these space improvements worth it? Now, you might know that moving around the cabin while flight attendants are serving meals and beverages is kind of tricky. Plus, you have to eat at a specific time with everyone else. Or, if you're not feeling hungry, forego the meal altogether. Well, robots might be the solution. One company has suggested using perfectly sized pods that could slide along the rail in the middle of the aisle, delivering drinks and food ordered by passengers. This way, you could get your meal at the most suitable time for you without leaving your seat. This solution is likely to solve the problems with meal service. Even better, it might allow for fewer galleys and large planes. Unfortunately, this idea was filed 60 years ago and hasn't been implemented yet. So maybe it's not as great as it sounds. Another idea connected with in flight meal service includes using AI. According to its creators, the technology will record what passengers leave on their trays and later use this data to suggest various catering plans on subsequent flights. Now, even though these innovations sound like they're going to make traveling way more comfortable, they're not exactly revolutionary. But look at these innovations vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Hyundai Transys' air taxi cabin concept optimizes space and prioritizes your privacy in a shared cabin. If we talk about short flights, there's City Airbus Next Gen. That's an all electric, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle with four seats based on the lift and cruise concept. It can operate within the range of 50 miles and has a cruise speed of 74 miles per hour. 
Another amazing prospect is passenger aircraft with AI co-pilots, or even pilots. Some experts claim that planes could potentially be flown on a fully automated basis. Not everyone agrees with this idea, though. A skilled pilot is part of a complicated safety system that reduces risks and keeps passengers safe. Pilots have to be navigators, technicians, engineers, and weather experts. On a regular working day, a pilot needs to deal with ground crew, other air crew, cabin crew, air traffic control, and passengers. That's a lot. And don't forget that they need to communicate well, not only in aviation terms, but also on an interpersonal level. Will AI be able to do the same? Time will tell. But let's get back to the boldest ideas about the future of air travel. Some experts think that sometime around 2040, you'll be able to catch a hypersonic plane ride. Lots of people believe that the era of supersonic planes finished in 2003 when the Concorde commercial airplane was decommissioned after decades of being unprofitable. But it seems the situation might change soon. New supersonic aircraft will fly at incredible heights, and their speed is likely to be at least six times the speed of any other passenger plane. Traveling from New York to London, in this case, will take less than two hours. By comparison, these days, it takes a conventional airplane eight hours to fly from one of these cities to the other. There is one problem, though. The supersonic plane tickets will cost a lot. And statistically, people tend to prioritize price over speed. So experts don't think that a lot of people will be eager to pay a few thousand dollars to get from London to Sydney in four hours. Plus, such planes will need a lot of liquid hydrogen fuel. And at the moment, it's not cheap. By the way, you might not recognize a plane from 2050. These flying machines will keep changing for the next several decades. And the chances are high that, at some moment, windows will start to disappear from airplanes altogether. This way, aircraft will become stronger and better suited for high speeds. Windows make planes heavier which results in larger fuel consumption. No wonder cargo planes don't have windows. Planes will also become sleeker and will likely be covered with solar panels. There's also a concept of a plane with its cabin made out of transparent polymers. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd ever board such a plane. Talk about aerophobia. The chances are that in a few decades, we'll see a hypersonic plane with a jet engine that can turn into a rocket that can fly into space. Liquid oxygen would get injected into the exhaust, turning the engine into a rocket. It would help the aircraft reach enormous speeds. And on the way back, the engine would turn into a regular jet engine once again. Okay, shocker. Airplanes don't take off with the wind, but actually against it. I'd think that if you take off with the wind, it pushes you forwards and helps you fly faster, but this is wrong. So I did some digging for us. We should think of an airplane as a kind of kite. To make a kite fly, you launch it against the wind, and so it flies. Here's how it works. There are four forces of flight, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The lifting force is generated because of the differences above and below the kite. Above the kite, the speed of air is higher than below it. So, the pressure below is higher than that of the pressure above, and the kite is pushed forwards. This is the lifting force. There's also an opposing force, the force generated by gravitation that pushes the object down. That one is called weight. The thrust is the force that pushes the object forward. In the case of a kite, it's generated by the string, the wind, and the forward motion you're making. In the case of an airplane, the thrust force is generated by the engines. Finally, drag is the opposing force of thrust. So, to launch a kite into the air, the lifting force must be greater than that of the force of weight. Then, to stay in the air, all four must stay in balance. Lift must be equal to weight, thrust must be equal to drag. The moment the plane takes off, going against the wind helps to generate the needed lifting force faster. Yes, going against the wind does decrease the ground speed of an aircraft, but that's not the speed we need. An airplane flies due to the speed of air flowing over the wings. 
This airflow isn't generated by the plane's engines, but by the wind. And the higher the airflow, the higher the lift. Going against the wind increases the flow of air over the aircraft's wings, giving it an additional lift and allowing it to achieve a higher altitude in less time because it takes off at a greater angle. The same works for landing. Landing against the wind lets a pilot to descend at a shorter distance in a shorter time. The airflow and the lifting force are the things that are responsible for turbulence. The direction and speed of the wind, and therefore the airflow, isn't constant over time. Sometimes it changes pretty quickly, like 100 times per second. So one moment there's more lift, and the other moment there's less lift, and then the plane is shaking. This is called the turbulence zone. It's not dangerous at all, it just means that you fly through the zone of a highly constant wind, and that's all. So if a pilot is given the option of how to take off, they'd pick to take off into the wind. It's not always the case, and it's not a problem taking off with the wind, but going into it helps a lot. Many airports are designed so that most runways are taking the direction opposing the most typical wind direction of the area. Also, taking off and landing are the most dangerous stages of any flight. That's because the pilot has less time and space to react to any occurring problems. In the air, even if both engines stopped working, a plane won't just start falling. Instead, it'll start gliding through the sky, losing about one mile of altitude for every 10 of them going forward. So, the pilot will have about eight minutes to react and find a safe place to land. During takeoff and landing, the time is limited. If an engine fails, the pilot will have seconds to decide if they should still take off and deal with the problems in the air or cancel the flight. The thing is that canceling isn't even always possible, even if something happens. If the plane has already reached a speed of 100 miles per hour, it can't possibly be stopped before the runway ends. Physics. And getting out of the runway isn't good. Flying is costly, so not only the passengers, but the airline as well wants to make the flight as fast and short as possible. So there's no surprise here, there's always the most efficient way to go from point A to point B. And the shortest way is, of course, a straight line. Now, look at some aircraft routes. These don't exactly look straight, but don't let this trick you. We have to keep in mind that the Earth isn't flat like we see on a map. It's a sphere. So these lines only appear like arcs when we project them on a map. In reality, they're pretty much straight. If there's an efficient way, this means that every airline and every plane wants to fly this way. But there are hundreds of planes going from North America to Europe every day, and many go at the same time. Turns out, the air highway is pretty busy. So how come the planes never collide? That's because before a flight starts, the crew make a strict flight plan that is uploaded to the aircraft's computer and that pilot will have to follow. To be completely honest, there are several of them just to have options if something goes wrong. What helps to avoid any colliding is that the airspace is three-dimensional and the planes don't only fly in several lines as cars, but also at different altitudes. Air traffic is managed by dispatchers who watch for planes and control that they don't get closer to each other than three miles. There's also flight level regulations. All the westbound flights fly at even numbered altitudes, like for example, 34,000 feet or 36,000 feet. And all eastbound flights fly at odd number altitudes, like 35,000 feet and 37,000 feet. This means that there's a couple of thousand feet between the planes flying in the same direction. To share the sky safely, each aircraft has to follow their own airway that even has a specific name. There are also some parts of the air that are especially busy, having remarkably high traffic because many planes fly there every minute. So, whenever an aircraft enters a busy zone, it has to stick to a very specific route. So, usually, commercial aircrafts fly on the altitude between 31,000 and 38,000 feet. This altitude is reached within the first 10 minutes of the flight. So, why so high? With height, the air gets thinner, so the plane faces less resistance and can fly faster and burn less fuel. Another reason that they fly so high is that the plane avoids most of the weather patterns that usually happen way lower. High winds and rain happen in the troposphere, the atmospheric layer that is closest to the ground. Planes fly just a little bit above, but already in the next layer, the stratosphere. 
Since most of the weather phenomenon are avoided, the flight is smoother and there's less turbulence. But then why don't they fly even higher? Remember the force of weight that pushes the object down. An aircraft is very heavy, and the more you weigh, the harder it is to get higher. Because the force is stronger. To push it even higher, more fuel will be needed, and that's inefficient. Also, the oxygen becomes too sparse to fuel the engines, so the planes usually fly the most efficient way. High enough to avoid the weather patterns, but not much higher so that they don't spend too much fuel. If you've ever flown, you've probably noticed those little holes on the windows. An airplane window has three panes of plexiglass. That tiny hole is only in the one that's in the middle. It exists to regulate the huge pressure difference inside and outside the cabin. This way, the outer plane can handle the load. If the outer pane breaks, the middle one will keep the window intact. Also, that hole also keeps the windows from fogging up. Have you noticed that whenever you enter the plane, you enter it from the left side? It's not random. Firstly, the captain usually sits on the left side of the airplane cabin, so it's easier for the captain to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge from that side. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with the baggage on the right side. With passengers loading the plane from the left side, the crew can do their job undisturbed. Seat pockets on planes are mostly filled with in-flight magazines, a plane safety guide, and information about the airline. But they're also home to all sorts of trash, grime, and bacteria that just don't belong there. A passenger coughs into a tissue or wipes their runny nose with a handful of them. But instead of immediately getting rid of them, it gets placed into the seat back pocket. Now another passenger comes along on the very next flight, sitting in that same exact seat. With limited space around them, putting some of their belongings into the pockets leads to potentially millions of germs spreading significantly to them. It's no wonder that these seats' back pockets can get so nasty. Everybody puts their trash inside of them. Passengers often leave uneaten candy bars, diapers, apple cores, and nuts. This leaves crumbs and other matters everywhere. All of this trash is taken out before the next flight, but they're rarely ever deeply cleaned. It's all dependent on the airline itself as to how often they'll really clean the plane and wipe everything down properly. The plastic tray tables where we eat and place our things are one of, if not, the dirtiest parts of any airplane. These seat back tray tables that we use can have over 2,000 CFUs, colony forming units of bacteria, per square inch living on their surface. The ridge texture keeps cups of soda from sliding off the table, also creating tiny mountain ranges where the microbes attach themselves. Sugary sodas and juices that spill onto tray tables throughout flights give bacteria the perfect environment to stay and feed. Bacteria love living on this plastic almost as much as human skin. And there are lots of microbes that your tray catches and holds onto, especially when they're not thoroughly cleaned. Much like air vents that are always fiddled with, seatbelt buckles are probably the most touched thing on any aircraft. The average buckle can contain nearly 1,000 colony-forming units of bacteria per square inch on it at all times. Passengers touch seatbelt buckles to go to the bathroom. Even after washing their hands, people will walk down the aisle touching all the headrests for balance to get to their seat. After settling in and buckling up, most will then touch their face, eyes, phone, and even food for the rest of the trip. Airports can be big virus spreaders, but they're cleaned constantly. The same cannot be said for the subway, buses, or even taxis. Subway door handles, luggage carts, chairs, seats, and poles are very rarely cleaned and are a breeding ground for all sorts of nasties. New York City's subway system is one of the dirtiest in the world, with a mind-boggling 2 million bacteria colonies per square inch on nearly every surface. Many of these have still yet to be identified. They're that rare. It goes with you everywhere, sometimes even into the bathroom. As a result, cell phones could be up to 10 times dirtier than any toilet seat. E. coli, the bacteria that can give stomach cramps and fevers, can live for hours on warm surfaces like phones. The best solution? Wash your hands thoroughly before touching phones and make sure that phone gets a good wipe down with a disinfectant. Most people have a smartphone by them day and night, meaning that all the bacteria picked up during the day is transferred to them. 
Everyone touches the remote control at some point, but it isn't even thought of when cleaning the house. It falls to the floor or gets into the side of the sofa, a warm, dark home for mold and bacteria, where there are lots of crumbs and grime. A good clean with an antibacterial wipe every so often will help keep it shiny and germ-free. Blowing out candles on a birthday cake can expel a mist of saliva that always lands on the birthday cake frosting. This can lead to some very unhappy birthday parties if someone is sick. Sometimes it's better to skip the candles altogether or accept the risk that every day is someone's birthday celebration and a little bit of spit won't always hurt you. A single ATM gets touched by hundreds of people in a day. The chances that at least one of those people touching the buttons is sick and freely spreading the flu or cold is naturally quite high then. The flu, for example, can live up to two days on objects. It can even be days after someone has recovered from that virus that it'd still be active and spreadable. ATMs are cleaned, but not all the time. It would be impossible to service every single one in a major city daily. A single dollar bill can be home to thousands of different kinds of bacteria, including the usual suspects like E. coli, staph, and a bacterium that causes acne breakouts. Paper money can reportedly carry more germs than a household toilet, and bills are a hospitable environment for gross microbes. The smaller in value of the bill, the dirtier it will be because it's in circulation more. Money can't be cleaned like a lot of things, but taking it to a bank for new, hopefully cleaner bills is possible. Use hand sanitizer and wash your hands after handling money too, just in case. Grocery store shopping carts can have more bacteria on them than what's ever been found in public restrooms. That includes toilet seats and the flushing handles. Cleansing wipe dispensers have been appearing at many major grocery chains, and some stores even go the extra mile to clean them after the day's through. But these simply aren't enough to keep up with the petri dish that the handles are. With over 100,000 bacteria per square inch, it's nearly impossible to keep them clean. Toothbrush holders hold on to moisture and are rarely cleaned, making them one of the dirtiest things in our homes. It can be filled with salmonella, E. coli, and lots of mold over time when it's not getting cleaned regularly. Wash your toothbrush holder in hot, soapy water every week to minimize the chances of getting sick. Toothbrushes should be changed every three to four months for a very good reason. It takes a while for the toothbrush to dry. This creates the perfect home for mold and fungus to spread and grow. There can be more than 600 different kinds of bacteria living inside of your mouth. A kiss alone can transfer about 80 million bacteria from one mouth to another. A good brushing routine will have around 1,000 to 100,000 bacteria living on each tooth surface. But for those that don't brush, bacteria can be up to 100 million or 1 billion bacteria on each tooth. The dirtiest thing in our home can only be one thing, the kitchen sponge. It's wet, absorbent, and food and dirt are rubbed into it all the time. Then we wipe down our kitchen tops just to spread all that grubbiness around some more. Sponges are very hard to keep clean. The best way to keep things sanitary is to replace it when it starts to smell bad. It's no surprise that if the sponges are filthy, then sinks are too. Rinsed fruit, vegetables, prepared raw meat, and dishes needing cleaning all make their way to the kitchen sink. This creates an extremely high breeding ground for E. coli, salmonella, and many other gross things. They'll stick to the sides and drain holes and grow like crazy. Clean sinks before and after each use, and make sure to keep them as dry as possible to prevent any mold growth as well. Restaurant menus and condiment dispensers aren't cleaned nearly as often as they should be. If someone with a cold was using the condiments right before you, this greatly increases the chance of the cold-causing bacteria being on your hands and then your fries. Menus are rarely washed with disinfectants after each use. Customers have been touching quite a few things like chairs, tables, their faces, or hair before they give the menus back. Dog toys need to be cleaned regularly to prevent any bacteria or mold growth from spreading too much. Each time a dog slobbers on a toy, they don't just transfer their mouth bacteria. They've created a sticky, wet place for other germs to live on. There's no way of telling just what their favorite plaything has picked up around the house or yard. Purses and bags could have more bacteria than we really considered. They're regularly placed on dirty floors, bathroom floors, countertops, and out on the street. 
This exposes them to all sorts of germs, like salmonella, E. coli, mold, and fungus, all the time. Alcohol wipes are very good to carry around in your purse or bag to give them a good wipe down when needed. Drinking fountains are a cesspool of bacteria and germs. Over 2 million bacteria per square inch can be found on the fountain's faucets alone. As they get wet and touched by hundreds of hands, the bacteria and mold begin to grow. If someone has coughed or sneezed near it recently, those particles will cling onto the water. This creates a higher chance of the next person drinking from it catching something. February 2nd, 1970. We're at an Air Force base in Montana. Today, the 71st Fighter Interceptor Squadron plans to hold a training sortie. Four pilots get into jet planes and take off. Shortly, one of the pilots accidentally activates the braking parachute. A fabric dome shoots out of the plane. It's filled with air and interrupts the flight of the aircraft. The pilot has to land. The other three pilots continue the training. They arrive at the designated place and begin to simulate an air fight. Every pilot is a professional in his field. They have undergone similar training many times. But something amazing is going to happen today. The pilot of one plane, Major Curtis, must fight with two other planes. One of the Major's opponents is Captain Faust. Two planes are chasing the target. Major Curtis turns his jet and directs it straight upwards. The other two planes follow suit. The Major performs a maneuver, vertical rolling scissors. He flies up in a spiral while simultaneously making a barrel roll. Then he turns around and flies down, performing a dive. The pursuers are not far behind. Major Curtis makes another aerial maneuver. He goes to the side and flies past Captain Faust. At this moment, the captain's plane begins to shake. Its front part lowers and the jet hurtles to the ground at great speed. Captain Faust can't do anything. The plane doesn't listen to him. The control stick doesn't work. The engine's breaking down. The captain activates the braking parachute, but that doesn't work either. The plane is getting closer and closer to the ground. It can no longer be saved. Now it's important to save at least Captain Faust's life. He ejects and opens the parachute. Suddenly, the abandoned plane starts to fly straight. The flaps on the wings are activated and it stops falling down. The plane without a pilot flies and slowly descends. It goes at a speed of 200 miles per hour and disappears from sight behind the cliffs. Captain Faust lands safely on a snow-covered field. The other pilots see this and are afraid the plane will fall in a nearby town. They immediately head in that direction. At the time, the unguided aircraft descends, touches the ground, and slides along the field. Next, it makes a 20-degree turn and breaks through a small fence. The plane stops at a farmer's field. The owner of the farm calls the local sheriff. The sheriff arrives and calls the nearest military base to report what happened. He approaches the fallen plane to assess the damage and turn off the humming engine. But as soon as he gets closer, the plane begins to hum and shake as if it wants to escape from there. The plane owners arrive. They are surprised because the plane is in almost perfect condition. They deliver it back to the base, repair it, and return it to service. In 2016, in Belgium, a train was traveling without a driver. That day, people at two railway stations saw a train slowly moving between them. It didn't make any stops, brake, or accelerate. It was just slowly riding onwards. Passengers couldn't contact the driver and get out of the vehicle because no one was controlling the train at the time. Panic was rising. People began to say that a ghost train without a driver appeared. But the truth turned out to be not so mysterious. The empty passenger train had been leaving the station according to the schedule when the driver noticed some kind of malfunction. He stopped the train and got out of the cabin to see what happened. But for some reason, the train started again by itself and the driver didn't have time to jump on it. Fortunately, everything ended well. The driver warned all his colleagues about the runaway train. Everyone was evacuated from the train stations. Then, at some station, one brave driver jumped into the cabin right on the move and stopped the stray train. Speaking of ghost trains, you can see such things in the UK. They pass through railway stations that have long been abandoned. 
If you get on such a train, you'll probably be the only passenger. Authorities let these trains drive because it's economically profitable for the country. To cancel the route of a ghost train, you need to go through a lot of bureaucratic procedures and spend tons of extra money. So they travel all over the country and don't bother anyone. Now we go to the ocean to learn about the ship that was drifting for several months without its captain. The ship's called Alta. It was bought by a new owner in 2017 and marked with the flag of Tanzania. Almost all cargo ships are equipped with AIS, Automatic Identification System. That's a navigation system that works on the principle of GPS. All vessels are equipped with AIS, so their movement in the ocean can be tracked. This feature was disabled for the Alta. The ship disappeared from the satellite's eyes and reappeared several times. In 2017, it sailed by Greek port cities. The Alta made 12 stops in three such towns in different parts of Greece. Then the AIS signal disappeared. Ten months later, the Alta appeared again on the northern coast of Africa. In September 2018, it was headed to Haiti. During this trip, the ship's engine failed. The nearest shore was far away. The ship began to drift. A few days passed. The crew couldn't repair the vessel. The food supply was almost out. The situation was getting worse as a strong hurricane was approaching the place where the ship broke down. Fortunately, a rescue boat came to the sailors. They were all evacuated shortly before the hurricane hit. The Alta stayed drifting in the ocean. After a while, another ship came to tow it to the coast of Guiana. But something went wrong. Somebody stole the Alta. It's unknown who did it and why. Then, almost one year passed. In the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, a British Navy ship notices the drifting Alta. There's no one on board. No one controls it. Then, almost six months later, a resident of a small town in Ireland sees the abandoned ship off the coast. Somehow, the Alta was able to cover the distance across the Atlantic and wash up on the coast of Ireland. The Irish authorities said it had been a miracle that no one else saw the ship. It sailed calmly for such a long distance, surviving storms. They started an investigation to establish the owner of the vessel. It's important to find a responsible person who will tow off the Alta. It's extremely difficult to do so, though. They didn't find the owner. One day, an unknown person called the Irish authorities and introduced themselves as the proprietor of the Alta, but didn't provide any evidence. But the record for the longest drifting vessel along the ocean belongs to the SS Bechimo. People were seeing this ghost ship at different times for 38 years. It was a merchant ship owned by a Canadian trading company. In 1931, the ship got blocked by ice off the coast of Alaska. A strong snowstorm began. The crew waited a week for the bad weather to end, but the storm only intensified. One day, when the storm subsided a bit, Part of the crew went to the nearest town. The rest of the crew members and the captain set up camp near the vessel. The storm didn't stop for a long time. The blizzard was so strong that people couldn't see beyond their stretched hands. Finally, when the storm was over, the captain went to find the ship. And couldn't. He decided it sank during the snowfall. A week later, the ship was found, drifting near the place where it was lost. Its hull was damaged so badly that it was unsafe to sail on it the captain decided to abandon the vessel. However, it didn't sink. For the next 38 years, it was seen drifting at various points along the coast of Alaska. The last time people saw the frozen ship stuck in the ice was in 1969. In 2006, a special project was created to find SS Bechimo. However, in all these years, they've found nothing. Its fate is still unknown. It's likely the ship found peace on the seabed of the Chukchi Sea. They make plane wings smooth to let air flow easily around their surface and reduce resistance during the flight. So why did they add these convex yellow hooks? They obviously worsen the aerodynamics. Yeah, they do, but they're also necessary for your safety. Imagine a plane making an emergency landing in the open sea. Everything's going well. The aircraft is sliding on the water. Then rescue boats sail to this place to evacuate the passengers. They leave the plane through emergency exits located above the wings. Before the door opens, the escape slide inflates. 
passengers need to walk on the wing and go down the slide. But the wing surface is slippery because of water. They might fall and get hurt. To prevent this, the stewards install a rescue rope. They attach one end to the door and the other to the edge of the wing, passing it through these hooks. During the evacuation, people hold on to this cable like a railing and don't fall. They can also attach rescue boats to the wing with a rope and these hooks, so the sea won't take people far away from the plane. By the way, the plane can stay on the water for 10 minutes to 60 hours, depending on the model, weather conditions, and the pilot's skills. Both the main and emergency exits have extra handles for crew members. During an evacuation, people may panic and accidentally push the flight attendants off their feet. To avoid a fall, they hold onto these handles. A seat belt on an airplane has a slightly different purpose from that in your car. The one in the vehicle protects you from a horizontal hit. When a plane is going through turbulence, it's shaking up and down. Your waist belt keeps you from hitting the ceiling. Crew members have handcuffs for problem passengers. If someone behaves badly and interferes with the flight, flight attendants have the right to chain them to their seats. To do this, they use police handcuffs or plastic ties. This is the maximum that can be done during the flight. Then they report a rowdy person to the airport and hand them over to the police after landing. During an emergency, oxygen masks drop automatically. They have an extra purpose you might not know about to equalize the pressure and prevent panic. Air pressure can change because of turbulence. So, among other things, the masks help passengers stay calm. Your seat is your safe haven. That life jacket under it won't let you drown. Also, the seat surface is made of waterproof material. If water gets into the cabin, the seat will save you from freezing, since it won't get wet. It's also fireproof. The cover can prevent the fire from spreading through the cabin. But more importantly, it can save you from the flames. Of course, you'll most likely never have to use this feature, but it's nice to feel safe, isn't it? You can use the tray table in the seat in front of you like a hammock. Just tie a belt, a blanket, or a towel around the table and stretch your feet out. You might have noticed black triangles on the wall above the seats. For you, as a passenger, they may indicate the seats that have the best view of the wings, where you can take the most beautiful flight photos. But the triangles weren't created for your camera. The crew members monitor the condition of the aircraft through windows under these signs. Suppose the wings freeze, the engine catches fire, or the pilot receives a signal about some problem. In that case, the crew will quickly move to the triangles and assess the situation. And there you are, sitting under the triangle, looking at the wing and thinking, why are the wings located in the lower part of the plane? They could install them above the windows or right in the center. Actually, some planes have them in the middle and higher up, and each location makes sense. The engine and turbines are under the wings. It's much easier to repair them since they're close to the ground. And in case of an emergency landing in the sea, the wings act as a rescue cushion. They help to keep the plane on the water. Empty fuel tanks under the wing can also help the plane stay on the surface. But this position has certain risks. Debris can get into the turbines on the runway. Fortunately, this is unlikely to happen since they carefully clean it. Planes with wings in the middle get the least air resistance. That's why they build fighter jets and supersonic aircraft this way. Big cargo planes have wings in the upper part of the hull. Thanks to it, the aircraft stays close to the ground. It makes it easier to load cargo. Also, it's safer to land on unprepared runways with high wings, since debris won't get into the turbines. The aerodynamics of these planes works better thanks to such wings. They get less air resistance and deliver cargo faster. Oxygen inside the masks is a combination of chemicals. The transportation of oxygen tanks is too expensive for the airline. They take up a lot of space and increase weight, which leads to extra fuel consumption. Therefore, they use a chemical oxygen generator. It's located in the panel above your head. There's a small tank with barium, sodium, and potassium compounds. They mix and create a hot chemical reaction that releases oxygen and passes it into the mask. Small holes in windows save the glass from breaking. The air pressure inside the aircraft is much stronger than that outside. 
the difference is so big that the air can just break the glass from the other side. To prevent this, they drill small holes. The air penetrates there and reduces the load on the window. By the way, they have a round shape for the same reason. It's ideal for an equal distribution of air. If they were square or triangular, air streams with moisture would accumulate in the corners. It would lead to destruction. Plus, all water gets dried out thanks to the hole. Windows are made of triple glass. The outer glass takes the pressure. The middle one works like a fuse. The third layer protects the second one from passengers who like to touch it. Technically, the plane could fly with one layer, but it would be dangerous. They also installed extra protection for the wheels. They experience huge loads during landing, but don't worry, they won't burst. The tires can withstand pressure five to seven times bigger than they actually get. See the toilet sign on the door? There's a secret latch under it. Crew members can unlock the door from the outside, so don't expect complete privacy. Of course, it's prohibited for other passengers to do that. The cabin crew can open it in case of emergencies. When flight attendants pass through the cabin during the flight, they always touch the upper shelves above the seats. They don't check if the luggage compartments are closed. Along the bottom of these compartments, there are handles in the form of jagged edges. Flight attendants hold onto them not to fall. It's a pretty convenient thing, especially for those who don't like touching the seats with sitting passengers on the way to the toilet. There's an important reason why they install turbines under the wings. Previously, they put them in the plane's tail to improve the aerodynamics of the flight. If one of the engines stopped working, the cabin wouldn't shake so much. Yes, planes can fly with one turbine running. Also, the wings were thinner and streamlined thanks to turbines in the tail, which was also good for aerodynamics. But it turned out that such a location meant additional costs. The engine in the tail was inconvenient to maintain. They used to place it high, so people needed special equipment and extra time to service it. And of course, it affected the ticket price. They started to install turbines under the wings to save money and time. Have you ever noticed the flashing light in the cabin before takeoff? This happens when the pilot disconnects a plane from the airport power supply and switches to the onboard one. This rapid transition may cause flashing. A plane with no identification marks is approaching the coast of Indonesia. It's not the most peaceful of times, and the flight operator is alarmed. Two fighter jets take to the sky, about to take down the unidentified plane. It's all about to end in a disaster, when the fighters notice one strange detail. December 1st, 1941. Captain of a Boeing 314, Robert Ford and his team are preparing for one of the longest flights on one of the biggest planes in the world. The Boeing 314 Clipper California is a high-capacity seaplane. It has no landing gear, so it can only land on water. Its length is 100 feet, and its wingspan is 150 feet. This is more than a six-story building. And on board this plane, there is a restaurant, resting areas, and even a room with a bed. Despite its size, the Clipper California can stay in the air for more than 18 hours. Captain Ford doesn't suspect what is awaiting him ahead. He gets on the plane. Their flight is bound from San Francisco to Auckland, New Zealand. The first stop is Los Angeles. There's no problem with this. The next stop is Pearl Harbor. The flight is going fine. December 7, 1941. It's been three days since the plane left Pearl Harbor. The last final step of the journey remains. Flight to New Zealand. At this moment, Captain Ford receives an order to return the plane to the nearest Allied base. The way back is closed, so the plane continues to fly to Auckland. The Clipper lands safely at the Auckland airport and receives an order that seems impossible. Robert Ford and his team must paint over all the registration and identification marks on the plane and deliver it to LaGuardia, New York. Then, fly across the world. This is an uncharted route with a length of 23,000 miles. In the entire history of aviation at this time, no one has flown such a distance. The team doesn't have maps or modern navigation devices. They don't know the lands they will fly over. They don't know who they may meet on their way and at which airports they will land. They must maintain and repair the plane themselves, extract fuel, and plot the route. At the same time, they have almost no money. Immediately after receiving the order, the team goes to the Auckland Library. They study all the atlases and maps to create a detailed flight plan. First, they need to get to Australia. 
then fly to Africa along the coast of Asia, and then they should go to the U.S. The crew paint all over the signs on the plane and prepare for takeoff. Fortunately, before the start, one banker finds about their situation and gives them $500. The plane takes off. The team didn't notice they forgot to paint over the American flag. In a few days, it will save their lives. Before Australia, they fly to New Caledonia to evacuate a group of people from there and deliver them to Australia. The operation is successful. In Australia, the team needs to refuel the plane. They don't find special transport for Clipper services at that airport, so the crew themselves transport 800 cans of gasoline. And here's an important detail. The Boeing 314 doesn't use conventional fuel. It needs to be filled with special high-octane aviation gasoline. Early in the morning, the Clipper takes off and heads to Indonesia. The flight is going fine. They are approaching the airport. Meanwhile, the captain of the base where the Clipper is supposed to land notices an unidentified plane. He doesn't know who's flying it and from where. No one warned him about it. It may be an enemy plane. Two fighter jets take to the sky. They are approaching the Clipper and don't see any identification marks on its body. The pilots are about to attack, but at that moment, they notice an American flag. If Robert Ford hadn't forgotten to paint it over, then everything would have ended badly for him and his crew. The fighters allow landing. The clipper lands on the water. A boat floats towards it to meet the plane's crew, but stops. It turns out the plane landed on a place filled with sea mines, so the boat doesn't dare to sail there. The clipper approaches the port and miraculously avoids contact with mines. Robert Ford and the crew of the plane are well met. They are going too quickly to rest and hit the road. But then a big problem surfaces. The plane is running out of fuel and at that naval base, there is only ordinary automobile gas. Nobody knows if the plane engine is going to go with it. It may burn out or stop working altogether, but there's no choice. They fill the tanks with ordinary fuel. Captain decides to take off using the remnants of aviation fuel, and during the flight, they switch to tanks with ordinary gasoline. When this happens, the plane's engine begins to clap and rattle, but after a while, it calms down. The flight continues. For 19 hours, they fly on dangerous fuel. Their next stop is Ceylon. The sky is covered with clouds. The pilot doesn't see the coast in the airport, so he decides to lower the plane below the clouds. They fly at an altitude of 300 feet above the surface of the sea and notice a huge whale ahead. The plane flies closer, and it turns out it's not a whale. It's an enemy ship. The clipper begins to gain altitude to hide back into the clouds. Finally, they are again surrounded by a white veil. The booms and blasts are heard behind and below the plane. The clipper's flying with zero visibility for 60 minutes. Finally, the clouds are clearing and they see the port of Ceylon. The team makes a short stopover and proceeds with its journey. As soon as the plane takes off, one of the engines explodes. Fortunately, they didn't have time to fly far from the port, so they successfully landed the plane on the water and repaired the engine. The clipper continues its mission. Now. Robert Ford's team flies mainly over land. This is very risky, since the aircraft doesn't have landing gear and it can't safely land on solid ground. Finally, they get to the Congo. The team has a great time here, gains strength, rests, and most importantly, gets high-octane aviation gasoline. Things are going great, but there's another ordeal ahead. Now, the aviators will have to make the longest flight in their journey. Their next stop is a port town in Brazil, and the distance to it is 3,500 miles across the ocean. The maximum flight distance of the Boeing is 3,700 miles. Any deviation from the course or a strong headwind can easily prevent the aircraft from reaching the port. Worried, the crew refill the tank and load additional fuel onto the plane. They leave the Congo, taking off along the narrow river. At this moment, the pilot notices the river ends a few miles away with a waterfall. The plane must urgently gain altitude, but it can't. The large amount of additional fuel bears the clipper down. The waterfall is getting closer. In the last seconds, the plane manages to rise to the desired height. But even after the waterfall, Boeing still doesn't get high enough. It hovers right above the rocky coastal cliffs. A slight inclination can lead to a crash. Fortunately, they manage to pass unharmed. The plane rises to the perfect height. During the flight from the Congo to Brazil, the crew broke a new record. It's 23 hours and 35 minutes in the air. The tired crew make a long-awaited landing in the city of Natal. However, the rest doesn't last long. Two hours later, they take to the air and head to the next stop. 
an airbase in Panama. January 6, 1942, 5.54 a.m. The already legendary Boeing 314 is approaching LaGuardia, New York. The team can't wait to finish their journey. They contact the dispatch, and he tells them they can't land the plane only after 7 a.m., since the air terminal starts working at this time. For an hour, Robert Ford and his crew are circling in the air. It was probably the longest hour of their lives. Finally, the mission is complete. The Boeing 314 becomes the first passenger plane to make an almost around the world trip. This long flight lasted more than a month. This plane spent 209 hours or eight days in the air. During this time, it covered more than 30,000 miles and made 18 landings. Each airplane carrying over 19 passengers must have a crash axe. You will see it installed as a firefighting device. That way, if there's an electrical fire, crew members can cut away the cockpit or some other panels. The pilots can actually break the windscreen if something bad happens and people need to evacuate. Passenger planes are mostly white to protect them from solar radiation and its effects. Aircrafts need to remain cool at airports in particularly hot countries while passengers are going in or out. Brilliant white paint can bounce the sunlight back. It also protects some parts of the plane that are made of composite materials and prevents their damage since there's higher ultraviolet radiation at high altitudes. Commercial planes must get to speeds of at least 155 miles per hour to achieve stability and safety at takeoff. Some smaller planes can sustain altitude even at speeds of 30 miles per hour. But when speeds are that low, the plane can easily get destabilized and could even fail the takeoff. The white trails that planes leave behind, also known as contrails, are created because of water vapor. Vapor is produced during the combustion of fuel in plane engines. When the plane reaches its cruising altitude of 32,800 feet, temperatures get quite low about negative 67 degrees Fahrenheit, it's really cold. So, the water turns into particles of ice. How long these particles are going to remain visible mostly depends on humidity. The higher the level of humidity is, the bigger those trails get and remain visible even long after the plane has disappeared. Airplanes all over the globe get struck by lightning almost on a daily basis. A regular airplane in commercial service gets hit on average once a year. How often it happens depends on a couple of things. First, how many landings and takeoffs the plane performs since lightning mostly strikes at heights between 5,000 and 15,000 feet. It also depends on location. For instance, it's more likely for a plane to get struck by lightning around the equator and in some other parts of the world. Modern planes are designed to withstand such strikes. They have to go through special lightning tests to prove they can cope with strikes. Planes mostly fly at altitudes of up to 7 miles. There are some benefits like the thinner air or producing less aerodynamic drag, which also means less fuel consumption. The temperatures up there are lower, which makes the jet engines more efficient. That part of the atmosphere is also less turbulent which helps make flights smoother. Some planes have already gone into space, but not the ones you see at the airport. Those classical planes need air to go up, and space is basically just a vacuum. The first plane that reached space was designed around 70 years ago. During its first flight, it generated lift and stability using its thin, stubby wings. It traveled more than five times the speed of sound. There are at least one sextillion planets out there in our universe. To give you an idea of how huge this number is, our planet weighs almost one sextillion times more than some animals like a bear. None of these planets are cubic, triangular, or any other shape. They're all round. At its beginnings, a planet is just a cloud of dust and rocks that rotates around a central star. Dust and small pieces attract each other because of gravity, and they keep doing it until they form a blob. Now, the blob starts attracting more matter. It grows and gets bigger until it's done with collecting everything in its path. 
Gravitational forces work equally in all directions, so that blob gets a round shape. But not the perfect one. Our planet, for instance, is almost a sphere, but with a bulge in the middle. The bulge is there because the Earth is spinning. Every time it rotates on its axis, the middle part travels further than the top. The area at the equator is moving quicker than the area at the poles. And the faster you spin something, the more you'll throw it outwards. Sound will travel four times faster in water than in air. It's a wave, and that's why it moves faster in a denser substance. Particles that are close to each other, as in denser substances, will bump into each other more easily. Water is denser. There are 800 times more particles in a bottle of water than in the same sized bottle filled with air. Bubbles are round because they occur in a thin film, such as one of soapy water traps air. The molecules in the film attract each other. That way, they stick together and also shape a sphere, because that's the smallest possible area that encloses any given volume. They can't get any smaller because they have trapped air inside. You can turn your pencil into a diamond. If you apply a temperature of 2,550 degrees Fahrenheit and pressure of 55,000 atmospheres, you can transform graphite into diamond. There are actually two variations of a single chemical element, carbon. Diamonds aren't just used in jewelry, but for different purposes. For example, as a cutting tool for electronic devices. Beavers are amazing builders capable of creating cool and complex riverside structures. They build them to protect themselves from wild animals that might go after them, like wolves or bears. But not in the way it may look at first. Beavers don't really live in their dams. They only use them as a barrier, making some sort of a pool or pond of deeper water. That's where their real home is, in the pool. It's like a small island or dome lodge. It's a dry area where beavers are safe. They can also store their food there. These pools are deep enough for land animals to avoid them. Beavers dig underwater tunnels that are entrances into their home. If a predator or some other danger is coming, they can quickly escape to safety. Some animals sleep while standing. Zebras, elephants, horses, some birds like flamingos. Cows can sleep while standing, but they prefer to lie down when they want to rest. To sleep while standing, animals need to have legs that can align vertically. That way, they don't have to activate their muscles to keep them standing. Their knees also lock in place. It's better for these animals to sleep while standing because they'd probably be too slow to react if there was a predator going after them. When we laugh in some unpleasant situations, or when we feel nervous, we're actually trying to mask our true emotions. For example, you do something embarrassing and try to cover up the shame you feel. Also, we're more relaxed after laughing. So if you're nervously chuckling in an unpleasant situation, it can help you clear some of your negative emotions. When you buy a bottle of water, you can see it has an expiration date. It's not that the water inside will turn bad. The expiration date is there because the plastic may start to leach into the water over time and contaminate it with chemicals that might be bad for us. The moon has its own time zone. The astronomers created a special watch for all moonwalkers. It measures time in lunations, which is the period of time the moon needs to rotate and revolve around our planet. Each lunation is almost 30,000 Earth days. You can decaffeinate your coffee if you take it into a sauna to moisten the green coffee bean within temperatures of 160 to 210 degrees Fahrenheit. The point is to get 10 milligrams or less of caffeine per one coffee. That's when you can put it in the decaf category. One serving of regular coffee has 50 to 75 milligrams of caffeine. There's a reason the Earth spins. Our solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago. There was a raging cloud of dust and gas. Molecules and atoms in that cloud had a tendency to rotate in a certain direction. That same cloud collapsed under gravitational forces. Gravity magnified its initial rotation and then flattened it out into a disk. Our planet formed within that disk, and now it's spinning because of that old pattern of its parent cloud. 
tires on the landing gear don't burst because they're designed for a load that's four to five times as great as they experience during landing. The wheel itself might break, but the tire won't burst. This little tip based on people's psychology can help you choose the fastest line at the airport. If there are several lines at check-in, opt for the left one. It's believed that you'll get to the counter more quickly this way. Most people are right-handed and intuitively choose the right side. Your skin usually becomes a bit dry during the flight. This happens because of low humidity levels in the cabin. Bring a good moisturizer with you to keep your skin hydrated on board. Do you know that airplane pilots always eat different meals before a flight? This way, if one of them gets food poisoning, the other will be able to take control of the plane. Airplane tray tables are some of the dirtiest surfaces in the cabin, so make sure to wash your hands frequently. And clean that table with an antibacterial wipe to get rid of all those bacteria living there. If you're sitting in an aisle seat, you can have more space to stretch your legs out. Just push the button on the underside of the outermost armrest. This will move the armrest up, giving you more space for your legs and preventing the armrest from jabbing into your side. Here's a reason why they turn the lights off in the cabin. Passengers need to get used to the darkness in case an emergency landing happens at night. This way, their eyes are already used to the absence of light, which makes it easier to evacuate. Flight attendants ask you to open window shades so they can see what's happening outside. This way, they can choose the best way to evacuate passengers in case of an emergency. Almost all passenger planes are white since this color best reflects the sun's rays and prevents the plane from heating up. Another good reason is that white paint is cheaper. Also, workers and engineers can easily notice any damage on a white surface. It's better to avoid making important decisions during a flight your brain doesn't get enough oxygen at such heights. This negatively affects its functioning. Chewing gum, hard candies, and mints can help you to avoid this annoying ear popping during takeoff and landing, but not because of the candy itself. You feel better thanks to the process of swallowing. Yawning helps too. As for the gum, it also helps get rid of that bad breath caused by the thin air at high altitudes, which pulls moisture right out of your body. Dry air can make you feel as if you're coming down with a cold. The air in the cabin dries out your nose and throat as if you have symptoms of a cold. These symptoms usually go away right after landing. The water they use to make coffee and tea on board isn't always clean enough. Yeah, many companies use very good water filters now, but still, it's better to ask for bottled water if you're thirsty. That tiny triangle on the aircraft wall over your seat means a lot for flight attendants. These triangles mark the windows through which you can see flashing indicators. Those signal the retraction of the landing gears and the closing of the flaps. Let's say the pilots find out there's some problem. In that case, a flight attendant rushes to the necessary window to check what's happening. But for passengers, this is just the best place for photos, since you can see the wings perfectly. Seats in the middle of the cabin above the wings are the best for you if you have motion sickness. This area is more balanced and shakes the least during turbulence. If you tend to get nervous during the flight, do some physical exercise not long before boarding the plane. A little workout helps lower your stress levels and makes your body release endorphins, the happiness hormones. Also, this physical activity compensates for the hours you spend sitting still. The turbines are located under the wings since this makes it cheaper, faster, and easier to service the engines. Previously, they used to be placed in the tail. It required expensive equipment and much more time to repair. When they started installing the engines below the wings, ticket prices went down. Imagine you're flying in a hot air balloon. See the burner system installed under the gas bag, also called the envelope? It heats the air inside, which makes the balloon go up. So, turbulence is the same hot air but created by nature. When the air heats up, it rises a plane. When it becomes cooler, the aircraft goes down. And passengers feel as if they're riding a roller coaster. A stream of hot air left by another plane can also cause turbulence. It's common for most flights, but usually, turbulence is so light that passengers don't feel it. Do you know that planes can fly even after one engine fails? Pilots can control such emergency situations and land the aircraft safely. 
Passengers may feel a slight tilt during the flight, but in most cases, they don't even know the plane is flying with only one engine. Your eyes get oxygen straight from the air. It's not delivered by the blood. So your eyes can feel somewhat dry during the flight. Put eye drops in your bag. They'll help you keep your eyes moist. It's forbidden to carry large volumes of liquids on board because some hazardous substances can easily dissolve in water. If a plane has to land on water, its wings become a life-saving pillow. Empty fuel tanks help the aircraft stay afloat too. By the way, it can be from 10 minutes to 60 hours before the plane sinks. It all depends on the model, weather conditions, and the pilot's skills. Those smiling flight attendants you meet when you get into the cabin usually hide their hands behind their backs. They're counting people entering the plane to make sure that all passengers are on board. Despite all the words people say about airplane food, it's not actually so bad. The problem is your sense of taste. It's not so acute since the air in the cabin makes your mouth dry. It also dulls your sense of smell. That's why airlines add a lot of spices and salt to their meals. Is it true that your hair grows faster during the flight? Not really. Scientists haven't managed to prove it. This myth appeared in the first part of the 20th century when some passengers noticed that their stubble had grown longer during the flight. It's normal for people to get headaches during the flight, especially right after takeoff. You climb to an altitude higher than Mount Everest within about 10 minutes. These changes happen too fast for your body to adjust. Seatbelts on planes stretch across your stomach to save you from getting slammed against the ceiling in case of turbulence. When it happens, the aircraft starts moving up and down, and your waist belt holds you securely. And seatbelts in cars protect people from horizontal collisions. Airplanes have special protection from lightning. Even if it strikes, passengers won't feel it. Planes are covered with an aluminum coating that conducts electric current, but doesn't let it get inside the plane. Electronics and fuel tanks also have extra protection. Plane seats are so uncomfortable because airlines try to fit the maximum number of passengers on the plane. That's why there's so little space between seats. Two additional rows means 12 more passengers. Also, companies make airplane seats lighter to save on fuel costs. Even seemingly insignificant extra weight can cost an airline thousands of dollars. And by the way, your seat has a fire-resistant coating. It's necessary to prevent a fire from spreading in case of an accident. Airport workers transport unclaimed luggage to special centers. If the owner doesn't show up within three months, the baggage is put up for sale in specialized stores. You couldn't use your phone on an airplane in the past since cell phones were really dangerous for navigation. Their radio signals could disrupt the settings in aircraft electronics. Oxygen masks fall down not only during strong turbulence, but also when the air pressure inside the cabin changes dramatically. Passengers are okay if they put on their oxygen masks, but in such cases are considered to be an emergency. And pilots do their best to quickly go down to a safe altitude so that passengers can breathe without oxygen masks. Hello, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard today's flight from San Francisco to New York. Fasten your seatbelts, and I'll tell you what's going on inside the plane at different stages of the flight. Passengers always board from the left side. That's because the captain sits on the left side of the airplane cabin, so it's easier for him to align the plane with the terminal jet bridge from that side. Also, the aircraft is fueled and loaded with baggage on the right side. With passengers boarding from the left side, the crew can do their job undisturbed. If your priority is to get out of the plane as fast as possible once you arrive, pick an aisle seat near the front of the plane. If you want to have the most comfortable flight, pick a seat in the middle of the plane because the turbulence is less noticeable there. An even better option in terms of comfort would be those seats by the emergency exit. They have more legroom and you can stretch. If you want the safest seats on the plane, your best option is the back of it. Once you're seated, take your time to spot the nearest emergency exits. Count the number of rows between your seat and an emergency exit. It can save your life in case you have to leave the plane quickly. You'll manage to find the exit easily, even if everything around is dark or if you're blinded. You'll find it just by touching the seats and passing the number of rows you counted in advance. Boarding completed. Time to get ready for takeoff. Cabin crew are walking down the aisles to make sure all passengers are following their instructions. 
Okay, everyone has their seatbelts fastened and window blinds open. There's no one in the bathroom and the runway is all clear. Why aren't we still moving? We can go. Turns out the aircraft must wait for a while. It's all about safety. When a plane takes off, it activates two powerful forces. One is jet wash, a fast moving gas so strong it can easily flip a car. So no one can be near the plane. Another force is wingtip vortices that are the result of the wind generating the plane lift. These powerful rotating forces go from both wings and stay in the air for about three minutes after an aircraft takes off. If another plane flies into the air while the wingtip vortices are still there, the pilot will lose the roll control over the aircraft. The plane will flip over and crash. So, no plane is allowed to take off without waiting for at least three minutes after the previous one leaves. Back to the pilot's cabin. There are two people there, the pilot and the co-pilot. In case something happens to the first pilot, the co-pilot can take over. Both pilots eat different food to reduce the risk of them both feeling unwell. While the first pilot controls and adjusts the autopilot, the second one monitors the controls or communicates with the control tower. Also, there are checklists for safety standards to be satisfied at different stages of the route. So, while the captain is focused on the route, the co-pilot can complete the checklist and make sure that everything's going according to the plan. Flying is costly, so not only the passengers, but the airline as well want to make the flight as fast and short as possible. The shortest way is always a straight line. Still, aircraft routes look like an arc. It's because the Earth isn't flat like we see it on a map. It's a sphere. So, these lines only appear like arcs when we project them on a map. In reality, they're pretty much straight. Every airline and every plane wants to fly this most efficient way. But there are hundreds of planes flying every day, often in the same direction. So the air highway is pretty busy. The route data of every plane is pre-planned and is uploaded to the system. There are several of those so that the pilot has options if something goes wrong or if weather conditions change. The pilot can set up the right mode and autopilot can control the airplane within its uploaded route. Keep up the altitude, speed and direction. The pilots, meanwhile, keep an eye on the autopilot and focus on other tasks like navigating, planning and communicating with air traffic control. On the ground, air traffic is managed by dispatchers who watch over planes and make sure they don't get too close to each other. The air traffic is especially heavy in some places. So, when an aircraft enters a busy zone, it has to follow a very specific route. There are also specified points called fixed navigational aids, or, shortly, nav aids. Those are devices on the ground that send radio signals in the sky that an aircraft can pick up on. There are also waypoints, which are geographical points on Earth. They're loaded into the GPS system, and an aircraft has to follow them. So basically, the whole route is flying from one waypoint to another all the way to the destination place. Time to start the descent. You can see the plane's altitude on the control panel. The pilots know the plane's speed, so they can calculate at what distance to destination to start their descent. If the altitude is 27,000 feet and the speed is 300 nautical miles per hour, the first number divided by the second gives us 90 nautical miles. This is the point they have to start the descent to maintain the descent path. There are also a couple of other things to consider, such as the wind speed and direction, or uneven speed drop. To descend, pilots have to get approval from the controller. Sometimes, due to traffic, they don't get it right away. So, they just keep moving forward without descending, therefore shifting away from the descending profile and land when the approval is given. Takeoff and landing are the most crucial and dangerous phases of any flight. That's because the pilot has less time and space to react to any occurring problems. In the air, even if both engines stop working, a plane won't just start falling. Instead, it'll begin to glide through the sky, losing about one mile of altitude every 10 of them going forward. So, the pilot will have about eight minutes to react and find a safe place to land. If an engine fails during takeoff or landing, the pilots will only have seconds to decide if they should still take off and deal with the problem in the air or cancel the flight. 
Even if something happens, canceling the flight isn't always an option. When the plane reaches the speed of 100 miles per hour, you can't possibly stop it before the runway ends. And getting off the runway isn't good, to say the least. To ensure everyone's safety, the rules at these stages of the flight are especially strict. You should turn on the airplane mode on your devices to make sure that the signals that devices transmit don't interfere with the plane's electronic systems and don't block the radio's frequency. You've probably heard that clicking sound a speaker makes right before your cell phone gets a call, if it's right next to the speaker. These sounds are what the pilot might hear instead of the instructions while communicating with air traffic control. Even a one-second interference can cause a lot of confusion. Just some certain types of cell phones can cause this problem, and if it's a combination of factors, the cell phone type, how far away it is from the cabin, and how many cell phones aren't in airplane mode. The cabin crew can't find out which of the passengers didn't put their phone into airplane mode, but the pilots will always know when many people didn't do it. You should keep your window blind open during takeoff and landing for safety reasons as well. This way, your eyes get used to the light or the darkness outside. In case of an emergency, during these risky stages of the flight, people who are comfortable with the natural light will react and evacuate faster, which is crucially important when every second matters. For the very same reason, the lights are dimmed in the airplane. This way, the light will be closest to the light outside the aircraft. Another reason is that if the window blinds are open, people from the outside can see what's going on in the plane. For example, they can see if there's a fire inside and where exactly it is. This way, they can plan the evacuation better. They ask you to fold up your table and put up your seat in the upright position to ensure that in case of an emergency, there will be no obstacles in the way. Everyone should be able to leave the plane as fast as possible. The passengers aren't allowed to use the bathroom during takeoff and landing because there's no seatbelt, no safe escape route with no obstacles, and it's not safe overall. A person can get trapped there during evacuation. The pilot isn't even allowed to take off or land while someone is in the bathroom. And looks like we're ready for landing. Welcome to New York. The plane rumbles into life and is soon roaring down the runway. You look out the window, and your heart is racing. How exciting to be going on a holiday, finally. It's only once you're above the clouds at 35,000 feet that you get up for a stretch. You look down the aisle and notice that the cockpit door is open. To your growing horror, you notice that it's completely empty. The pilot's either napping somewhere, gone for a comfort break, or there's no one flying this thing. You ask the flight attendant, who tells you the truth. The plane is fully automatic and there's nothing you can do. Self-flying planes are no longer the stuff of science fiction. They're already here. Many companies say pilotless passenger flights are simply a case of not if, but when. The issue is convincing the general public that they're safe. Some don't realize that once the seatbelt sign has been switched off, your typical passenger jet is likely flying by itself already. The autopilot can even climb, descend, and turn as instructed. We've already been flown about by an automated system, we just didn't realize to what extent. A commercial airliner can already land itself, though it's tricky to set up. Presently, two well-trained pilots are still required to be in the cockpit, for now. Many companies, such as Merlin Air, have been testing small two-engine planes to auto-fly in the Mojave Desert. Airbus performed its first fully automated takeoff in December 2019, though there were two pilots in the cockpit, just in case. Some companies are developing hardware and software to retrofit older planes. The aim is to replicate everything a pilot can do via a set of computer systems. The barrier, they say, is human rather than technical. Old-fashioned lack of trust. The technical term for fear of flying is called aviophobia. It affects millions of people, up to 40% of all flyers. They're still flying, but they're just not particularly happy about it. Between 2.5 and 5% of the population are so anxious, they won't fly at all. And yet, statistics continually reveal that flying is one of the safest means of travel, with nearly 95% of transportation fatalities in the U.S. occurring on the roads. If you were to fly 500 miles every day for a year, the fatality risk is still only 1 in 85,000. Or, to put it in simpler terms, 
For the average American, the risk of a serious accident is just 1 in 11 million. There are much higher odds of being struck by lightning. Companies may be well served by offering breathing exercises and other strategies to make their customers feel more comfortable. It's surprising that airlines haven't already implemented a variety of programs to make travelers feel more relaxed. After all, many of these air accidents are caused by human error. Being automated may be a safer option. Then there's the other argument that it takes humans to create the automated systems. There's no doubt, though, that fully autonomous aircraft will soon be with us. As the population grows, our cities expand, and there will be more need for faster and more efficient travel. Many people will be reliant upon flying taxis to bypass hectic environments. They already exist. Not only can they cover short distances, but potentially thousands of miles. They can cover the same distance that a car can in a quarter of the time. They're much like helicopters in that they're capable of vertical takeoff and landing, known as VTOL, making them able to land and take off from almost anywhere. They will also be built of quieter mechanisms to keep noise pollution down, better than a train rattling past your bedroom window. They also use electric propulsion systems, which will keep emissions low. No endless traffic jams and mouthfuls of fumes. The difference with air taxis is that there's no pilot, with the destination locked in from the beginning. The challenge for designers is how to operate in environments with numerous structures, such as buildings and bridges, and how to navigate moving obstacles as well, such as other aircraft and even flocks of birds. Tackling a variety of weather conditions, too, can also make for complicated and even dangerous possibilities. Super storms, dust storms, snow, wind gusts, and even tornadoes can pose real problems. It's not like you can instruct your cabbie to take a different route. Or will we be able to do just that? Perhaps we could verbally tell the system to divert from its projected pathway. This is the same situation for planes, particularly in terms of weather and air turbulence. There is still much more work to do. Air taxis can only accommodate a limited number of people, though it's projected that short-range flights could carry up to 14 people. There is so much confidence in these vehicles that a startup company, Skyports of Melbourne, Australia, want to start operating a large-scale nationwide air taxi base by 2025. Other large corporations are also in the air taxi race, such as Boeing, Airbus, and Toyota. With larger planes already capable of pilotless flight, you may be wondering, why isn't this happening already? People will surely get used to it. Well, there are a few obstacles. There are regulations that are yet to be drawn up. Business people are already saying that regulators are falling behind, and that air taxis alone could be a multi-trillion dollar industry within just two decades. Not all experts agree that the technology is reliable. Some pilots have also stated that automatics can malfunction, and that someone must be there to take over. They also point to weather events that cannot be predicted and require the speed of human intervention. You could also argue that the pilots are going to say things like that because, well, they don't want to lose their jobs, and who can blame them? Yet they're not wrong. The Boeing 737 MAX, for example, was grounded in 2019 after two well-known crashes, one in Indonesia and the other in Ethiopia. The reason, in its simplest form, was due to flaws in the flight stabilization program Incidents such as these only reinforce the fear. While pilots rightly say they've had to intervene when computer systems don't function correctly, in return, there's been documented crashes because pilots did not trust their systems and ignored warnings. There's also a very important factor to take into account. Research has suggested that without pilots, airlines could save $35 billion a year. And that's a lot of motivation. Regardless, the industry is changing, and there's increased development every year. Sophisticated sensors, improved cameras, self-assessing systems. Despite these advances, though, basic questions are yet to be fully answered. What would the automatic pilot do if there was an emergency? Could it automatically scope out a place to land safely? Could it put out a distress call? And how would it communicate with air traffic control? This uncertainty is what makes people fearful. We only have to look to drones to see what's already possible. Whether operated via smartphone or from onboard a ship, drones are unmistakably becoming more commonplace and performing an array of tasks. From filming whales to delivering parcels and long-range intelligence gathering, they map inaccessible terrain and use thermal sensors for search and rescue operations. They can even drop in supplies in disaster situations. 
They're literally saving lives. Their usage has tripled from 2019 to 2021 and is expected to do so again by the end of 2022. And yet, none of this is actually new. Over a century ago, the British developed unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs. They managed to fly a radio-controlled monoplane on March 21, 1917. More prototypes were developed over the decades, and in the 1940s, thousands of pilotless drones, or OQ-2 radio planes as they were known, were built. Many variations have been used ever since. Model enthusiasts have been using radio-controlled toy planes for decades. Drones continue to grow in popularity due to their high level of convenience and effectiveness. For these reasons and more, the technological advancements continue at breakneck speed. And yet, their full potential has not been reached, not by a long shot. If drones can be used for such extraordinary means, imagine what pilotless planes could do. The sky is literally the limit. While many are still fearful, people have already been flying for well over a hundred years. The technology is there. It's whether the public is ready, in a manner of speaking, to take the leap that counts. When it's too cold outside, airplanes often get delayed, or in extreme cases, even canceled altogether. First of all, if it snows heavily, such conditions drastically decrease visibility, making it unsafe to taxi and take off. During a blizzard, flight control may command the aircraft to stay on the ground and wait until the snowstorm subsides. Ice on the runway is another reason. An airplane's landing gear are nothing like a car's wheels, and they can't be equipped with studs to avoid skidding. But even if they were, a plane needs to develop speeds on the ground that are much higher than on an average road to take off successfully. If the runway is slippery with ice, the airplane can slide off it easily. Things like this actually happened in the past. For example, in January 2014, the JFK airport in New York was shut down after a plane skidded off the runway and into the snow. Luckily, no one was injured, but the airport staff had to dig the aircraft out of the snow, and even the local police joined the efforts. Same story with landing, which is even trickier in freezing conditions, because a plane is in much less of a controlled environment and traveling at even greater speeds. What's more, while an airplane that's about to take off and skidding will probably get into an open area and stop there, one that's about to land could end up crashing into the airport's infrastructure. Needless to say, that's way more dangerous for everyone. Freezing weather conditions can also cause frost and ice sheets to build up on the plane itself. Airplanes are carefully engineered and any tampering with their structure may cause huge trouble. As experienced pilots say, even a thin crust of ice over the wings of a plane can mess with their delicate design and destroy lift. Planes can be de-iced though. The airport staff usually spray them with a special solution that doesn't let the ice build up on the aircraft's skin. But back to the runway. If it's covered with ice, there's little you can do. Unless the sun is shining, the chances of safely removing the ice from the pavement are almost zero. There's also a chance of damaging the pavement, making potholes, which can result in safety concerns for both takeoff and landing. Imagine driving over a pothole in a car at full speed. Pretty unpleasant. And now multiply it by about a thousand because a plane is much heavier than a car, and don't forget that the landing gear is not exactly there for driving. Jet fuel and the equipment that pumps it can freeze too if the temperature is too low. The fuel freezes at negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but that can only happen on the ground before takeoff. At a cruising altitude, temperatures may drop as low as negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but since the liquid is inside the plane and burning down steadily, it's much warmer there. On the ground, though, nothing stops the fuel from turning into ice. If that happens, no flights are available, obviously. Same goes for the pumping equipment. Even if the fuel is still liquid, the pump may cover with ice and just stop delivering the fuel into the plane's tanks. In the worst case scenario, it might even break down, leading to expensive repairs and prolonged delays in flights. Finally, ground crews have to do a lot of work before takeoff or landing, and they're all human after all, so they can't bear the freezing cold for too long. This issue is often resolved by tag teaming. One group of workers goes out in the field to do the job, while the other is waiting for them in a shelter. After 20 minutes or so, the first group returns to warm up, and the second one takes up the job where the first one left it. 
Although it's efficient, it still slows down the operations a lot, so that might also cause delays. But despite all the trouble freezing weather can cause, it's actually more beneficial for a plane than extreme heat. Cold air is denser than hot, so planes gain more lift and stay truer while in the air. They're more easily controlled in flight, too. Air molecules are slower and closer together, creating a steady flow of air around the wings and cockpit. At high altitudes, the air naturally becomes thinner as the air molecules spread out and become more scarce. That's exactly why planes can't get to the upper layers of the atmosphere. There's just not enough air there to create sufficient lift. The same happens when it's too hot down on the ground, though. Air molecules get faster and spread out, meaning the plane's wings don't have as much air to push off and get into the flight mode. To take off in extreme heat, a plane has to move much faster to generate enough air resistance and lift. But to move faster, the plane needs its engines to work better, and that's also impossible when it's too hot. As the air gets thinner, the amount of oxygen decreases too. And jet engines use oxygen in the atmosphere for combustion. When they lack this crucial element, they can't convert enough energy into thrust, meaning slower acceleration and worse energy output overall. So the problem is that the plane has to have a longer runway distance to build up enough speed and lift to take off. But it can't, because its engines are not working to the best of their ability. This usually doesn't cause trouble, but only up to a point. When the temperatures on the ground level reaches about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, some flights can get cancelled because it's simply dangerous for them to try and take off. Other planes are more heat-resistant and powerful, but that also depends on the heat. Some aircraft even have to reduce their weight by removing part of their fuel, cargo, or even passengers when it's too hot. Lighter load means better acceleration before takeoff, and it doesn't help to avoid cancellations, but it also means planes aren't working to their full capacity. The average cruising altitude for an airplane is about 35,000 feet. They don't technically need to be so high up, but that altitude gives the best speed and efficiency. Air gets thinner at higher altitudes, which means less wind resistance, but less lift. For most commercial aircraft, the area between 30,000 and 40,000 feet is the sweet spot where the two factors balance out. You probably still aren't using a laptop from 1999, and your computer isn't flying at close to the speed of sound. Fortunately, planes have a much longer lifespan than computers. There are airliners from the early 1970s that are still just fine. They might not be able to keep up in terms of speed and fuel efficiency, but older planes are no less safe than their modern counterparts. Contrails, those white trails airplanes leave behind them at high altitudes, are easily mistaken for engine exhaust, but most are nothing more than water vapor. During a flight, moisture in the air collects in the engines before being vented with the exhaust. The hot, wet air leaving the engines mixes with the cool, dry air found at high altitudes, resulting in long, thin lines of vapor. Humidity determines when contrails form and how long they remain visible. Ever notice the numbers on the end of a runway? They're actually used to show the pilot which direction the plane is facing. For example, the number 36 is short for a heading of 360 degrees or due north. Along with numbers, the letters R and L indicate if the nearest runway is to the right or left. The lights on the tips of a plane's wings are called position lights or navigation lights, and they're used during times of reduced visibility. They help planes to see each other in the dark and can also tell pilots what direction an aircraft is traveling. The red light marks the tip of the left wing, while the green light is on the right. The third light is white and found on or near the tail. It might seem odd that the flight crew cares whether your window shades are up or down, the main reason is so that the passenger's eyes can adjust to the outside light. Mostly, it's just a matter of getting people on and off quickly. But in an emergency, the last thing they want is people stopping to blink before they evacuate the plane. Oh boy! You take your seat on the plane and look around. It's a large aircraft, spacious and new. You look up. Something draws your attention to that small compartment above your seat that contains your oxygen mask. 
Come to think of it, you've only ever seen it during the in-flight safety demonstrations. Ah, maybe it's for the better, you think, and relax into your seat. Screaming and powerful jerks are what wake you up. One of the flight attendants is saying something in an urgent voice, but still disoriented after your nap, you can't catch the meaning of the announcement. And then, right in front of your face, you see an oxygen mask. Uh Uh-oh. You place the mask over your face. You did pay attention to the safety demonstration, hmm? Then you grip the armrest and close your eyes, trying to calm down. However impossible it sounds. But do you know what's going on inside your oxygen mask? Well, let's talk about it. An oxygen mask deploys automatically in case of loss of cabin pressure. It might happen for several reasons. For example, some problems with the fuselage or malfunctioning of the valves pumping air into the plane. But most of these incidents aren't life-threatening if the masks deploy as they're supposed to. The problem with the air above 10,000 feet is that it contains too little oxygen for people to breathe. That's why, once a plane rises higher than that altitude, the pressurization system springs into action. Its main task is to create the same breathable conditions as at the height of 5,000 to 8,000 feet. Now, if, for some reason, this system fails, oxygen masks drop. If this happens, it's crucial to put your mask on within the first 18 seconds after it deploys. If you procrastinate, you'll feel the effects of hypoxia, low oxygen levels in your blood, very fast. You'll become drowsy. And if you keep ignoring your oxygen mask, you're likely to pass out. Anyway, you acted fast and can now breathe freely. But for how long? And is it really oxygen that you inhale? Well, first of all, you notice with horror that your mask doesn't inflate. No worries, it shouldn't. It's supposed to rise and fall along with your breathing. So everything functions perfectly fine, even if it might seem it's not working. Now, hold on to your hats, here's shocking news. There isn't actually any oxygen in the mask. Instead of the gas, there are several chemicals. When they combine, they mimic good old breathable oxygen. The main reason for using the chemicals is safety issues. This mixture is way less combustible than oxygen tanks. Anyway, the chemical reaction that is happening in a deployed oxygen mask is the reason why you might smell something burning when putting it on. That's the chemicals mixing and forming the new substance. In case of a real fire, your mask simply won't drop. The chemicals inside can, unfortunately, fuel the flames. Oh, and don't forget that in your mask, there's only enough oxygen for 20 minutes at the most. This time is usually enough for the plane to get down to the necessary altitude. When the chemicals in the mask are all used up, the mask stops the flow of air. But by that time, you're already at an altitude where you can breathe without additional help. By the way, oxygen masks are not used too often. On US airlines, it's only been 2,800 cases over a period of 40 years. In other words, additional oxygen was necessary a mere 10 times per 1 billion flight hours. The average cruising altitude of a commercial aircraft is 31,000 to 38,000 feet. Why can't planes climb higher than that? Well, it's not that they can't, they simply don't because pilots can't count that high. No, not really. It's because if they did go higher, there would be serious safety issues. First of all, if a plane is flying very high, it takes much more time to get back to a safe altitude. During an emergency, like rapid decompression, when every second counts, it can become a serious issue. Plus, while traveling at altitudes higher than 38,000 feet, planes can't communicate with the ground services as well as they do when flying lower. At lower altitudes, planes can also partially rely on wind. And if they rise too high, without any additional support, they waste too much fuel to stay in the air. Once a plane climbs too high, the air can't provide enough lift to keep the machine going. The lift is created by the difference in air pressure. But at high altitudes, this difference is simply not enough. Air may not look like something real because it's nothing material, like metal or plastic. And still, it's one of the things that keeps planes aloft. Let's say a plane is heading for space. Ooh, It has large, cleverly designed wings and super powerful engines. But the higher it goes, the thinner the air becomes until there's hardly any air left. 
and then nothing can support the plane and help it go further if there is a near vacuum around. That's why we still need rockets to get to space. But back to your flight. The plane is now at a safe altitude, and you don't need your oxygen mask anymore. But one interesting detail gets you thinking. Throughout the entire ordeal, you didn't hear the pilots mention the details of the emergency even once. Well, that's because pilots are always very careful with what and how they say. They'll never announce anything dramatic like fail or malfunction. They downplay any existing problem by replacing zero visibility with some fog, something is broken with some technical problems, and so on. It's called positive scripting. Hey, looks like we've just jettisoned both our wings. Well, that should help us save on weight. Flight attendants are supposed to follow it as well. But passengers perceive pilots' announcements as more important and statistically listen to them attentively 100% of the time. At the same time, if there's a really serious problem you need to be prepared for, you'll definitely get informed. Now, picture this. You enter the passenger cabin of a spacious airplane. And as soon as you find your seat, you realize that for the next several hours, you're going to be crammed in the middle seat between two other human beings. But oh, look! There is a perfectly empty row of seats at the end of the plane. Time to switch places. But what you need to keep in mind is that by doing so, you might endanger the safety of the whole plane. Really? First of all, you aren't likely to be the only person willing to change your seat. But if a couple of passengers do it, they might upset the balance of the aircraft. And since most planes are extremely sensitive to any changes in their center of gravity, it can lead to very unpleasant consequences. Positive scripting again. Pilots must know the distribution of weight on the plane during the takeoff to make special calculations. If these calculations are wrong, there are chances that the aircraft will crash once it tries to leave the ground. Oops. But even if the worst doesn't happen, pilots can still have serious problems with controlling the plane. For example, one pilot almost didn't manage to turn the plane after just four passengers had left their assigned seats and moved to the front of the cabin. The situation was critical because the runway was unusually short. And if something had gone wrong, the plane wouldn't have been able to stop. It can also mess with the plane's balance if the airport staff load baggage incorrectly. For example, in the rear compartment instead of the front one. In this case, the machine can pitch up too fast, and the pilot will have a hard time trying not to lose speed. Now, that doesn't mean you can't change your seat on the plane at all. But before doing that, ask a cabin crew member if you're allowed to. Still shaky after the fright you've just had, you try to distract yourself. Luckily, you have a window seat and can watch the clouds and… Wait, you suddenly notice the way the airplane wings are flexing. They seem to flap so much that you get worried they're going to fall off. Eh, no worries. The wings are supposed to flex. They're designed this way. If they were stiff, they would snap off as soon as the lightest turbulence hit the plane. By the way, pilots recommend that nervous flyers who are afraid of turbulence should pick seats in the middle of the cabin. Turbulence affects the front and rear parts of the cabin the most. The middle, over the wing section, doesn't shake that much. Maybe you'll feel a bit calmer if you know that airplanes can safely operate with one engine, even during takeoff and landing. And both engines failing at the same time is almost unheard of. But even if something like this happens, a plane won't drop from the sky like a rock. If both engines stop working at a high altitude, pilots still have at least 20 minutes to find a place to land. A plane can land even if its wheels are broken. It does sound scary, but if the landing gear gets stuck, pilots just skid the plane's belly down on the runway. If everything's done correctly, such landings are more or less safe. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to land in our destination, more or less. You can easily remove post-it notes because their adhesive is not even. Sticky notes feature a plastic adhesive. It's spread out in blobs across that sticky part of the paper. When you slap a post-it onto a bulletin board, not all the blobs, that are technically called microcapsules, will actually touch the surface to keep the paper stuck there. You can easily unstick it. And then, when you want to reattach it to something else, those blobs of glue that are left unused will take over the role of the adhesive. 
Eventually, you'll use all the capsules of glue, or they'll simply get clogged with dirt. So, the note won't stick anymore. It's very satisfying to chew gum because it's made of rubber. Gum from before had an elastic texture because of something called chicle, a natural type of latex rubber. Now you can chew your bubble gum easily because it's made of synthetic rubber. Some of these are used in car tires too, while others are used in Elmer's glue because they mimic the effect of chicle. Office buildings are a bit taller during the night. When the employees are finished with work, they all go home. Tall office buildings get slightly taller. For example, a 1,300-foot tall skyscraper will shrink about 0.03 inches under the weight of 50,000 people inside, assuming they're all an average weight. You could actually heat your house with just 70 people. If you've ever been trapped in a small crowded room, you know people give off body heat. So you'd need about 70 people in motion to warm up your home in the winter using just their body heat. Or maybe 140 people standing still, if you consider the house uses four electrical storage heaters and humans radiate approximately 100 to 200 watts of heat in normal conditions. Why does glass break so easily? It's because its atoms are not very tightly arranged. Unlike other solid material like metal, glass is made up of amorphous, which basically means structureless, loosely packed and randomly arranged atoms. These atoms can't rearrange themselves that quickly to retain a firm structure, so glass collapses and fragments shatter everywhere. Do you know why airplane passenger windows are mostly below eye level? Aircraft are way cheaper, stronger, and easier to build without windows, but they're there because many people like the view. Particularly about 100 years ago, when flights were often conducted at low altitudes. Also, if some passengers are feeling sick, looking out the window can help them reconnect their sense of balance, as their eyes are continually reporting what's going on around them. Windows in this position also help distribute the load around them more evenly. The floor of the cabin where people sit isn't all the way at the bottom of the aircraft, which is why windows end up being quite low compared to both the overall volume of the cabin itself and the eye level of the passengers sitting down. Water feels colder than air at the same temperature because it's denser. Because of that, your body loses heat 25 times faster while surrounded by water than it would if it was surrounded by air that was the same temperature. Since it's so dense, water has a high heat capacity, which means it takes a lot of heat to raise its temperature just a little bit. Water is good at both retaining heat and cold. That's why the ocean is way cooler than land, and at the same time, the hot soup stays hot for a long time. Water is also a pretty good conductor, which means it effectively transfers either heat or cold to the human body. Have you ever wondered why water cleans so well? It's because of its asymmetrical molecules. They are made of two hydrogen atoms stuck to a single oxygen atom, which means they're triangular. That's why they have a slightly different charge on their different sides, similar to a magnet. The oxygen end of the molecule is slightly negative, while the hydrogen is slightly positive. Because of this feature, water is great at sticking to other molecules. So, when you want to wash away dirt, water molecules will stick to the dirt. They'll pull it away from the surface the dirt was on, no matter what it is. This is why water has surface tension. It's capable of sticking to itself, too. House cats share some similarities with big wild cats, but one of the things that sets them apart is their vocalization. The majority of large cats, like tigers and lions, will roar loudly so everyone knows they're coming to defend their territory. But with house cats, most of the time, you'll just hear purrs and meows. That's because of the physiology of their throat and voice box, which helps create these feline vocalizations, so a cat can either roar or purr but no cat can do both. Bobcats, cougars, house cats, cheetahs, they purr. Purring is specific because a cat creates it when it breathes in and when it breathes out. Roaring has evolved in a particular lineage of big cats, which includes tigers, lions, jaguars, and leopards, except the snow leopard, who lost this ability. They are capable of roaring because of the bendy bones in their throat. Mammals have their voice box in the throat, where air passing by its structures produces sounds. The vocal cords in the hyoid bones are the two main parts of the larynx that create different vocalizations in cats. You probably also prefer the pulse setting on your blender. And why wouldn't you? It just works better, 
and that's because of turbulence. When a blender stops chopping up food and starts spinning it around in circles only, everything you put inside is spinning at the same rate. It's not really about blending ingredients together, but about something called laminar flow. That means all the layers of liquid are continuously moving in the same direction. When you use the pulse function, your blender adds turbulence. So the fruit chunks are not just rolling around the sides of the blender, but they are falling into the center, which is when it's easier to blend them. So you'd like to open your window during a warm spring or summer day. It's so nice to hear the birds singing, and even when you come back an hour later, you'll probably still hear them singing the same song. They're hard workers, and the males are most likely guarding their territory and trying to attract a female. And other animals have their own tactics. Some like to rub their scent everywhere, but birds use a song to send the message, Hey, I'm letting everyone know, especially other males in the area, this is my space. So they'll continue singing the same song over and over again. During the winter, they will most likely sing fewer notes to each other, or just one note. They want to let others know that where they are is their space. Plus, they're trying to figure out if there's any food somewhere nearby. Why do cats like small spaces? First of all, they are solitary animals, which is why they always search for a safe hiding place to take a good nap. And if you see a cat curled in a tiny box, it was probably just trying to find a nice warm spot to sleep and avoid the cold floor. Cats prefer room temperatures to be about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. A bit cooler than this is comfortable for us. And if there isn't a convenient sunbeam to lie in, they will look for other solutions, like a cozy shoebox. Cats are pretty lazy. They can sleep up to 18 hours a day, most average between 10 and 13 hours on a daily basis. The majority of cats are most active during dawn and dusk. They're not the nocturnal animals that some of us think they are but a specific category called crepuscular animals, together with other creatures like hamsters, ferrets, and stray dogs. Over millions of years, cats have evolved to become low-light predators. Their eyesight is adapted for activities during twilight. And since that's when they're most active, they save their energy for dusk and dawn. Before they became domesticated, cats would have had to expend large amounts of energy at these times, finding, going after, and catching their prey. House cats no longer need to hunt before each meal, but their natural instincts still encourage them to conserve energy for twilight periods. Why are four-leaf clovers so rare? Similar to animals, plant genes are located in small packages of DNA in the nucleus of each cell. They're called chromosomes. Our chromosomes come in matched pairs, but clovers have four copies of every chromosome per cell. There's a gene responsible for four-leaf clovers, and it's recessive. That means this plant will create four leaves only if it has a four-leaf gene on all four chromosomes. And that's pretty rare. Also, some environmental conditions like soil activity and temperature can also affect whether the four leaves appear. Interestingly, these anomalies tend to happen in clusters. So if you find one, look around you. There might be more of them. Why do cats like to like people? Whoops, that's supposed to read lick people. Sorry. There are a few potential reasons for this. First, they're collecting biochemical information from your skin. They could also be marking you as one of their possessions. Admit it, this totally sounds like cats. And it could be that they're just letting you know they trust you. Or at least showing you they don't find you to be some serious threat or competition. How come bananas get sweeter as they ripen? Fruits don't disperse their seeds randomly. They do it when animals eat them. At a certain stage, they suddenly increase their sugar content, which is how they try to encourage animals to eat them at that stage, specifically when their seeds are mature. Mature seeds have developed special coatings that protect them when um, passing through the uh, animal's digestive system. Do I have to paint you a picture? Why does our skin get wrinkly after we spend time in water? After 5 to 10 minutes in the bathtub, you will notice there are small wrinkles forming on your feet and hands. Scientists speculate that it could be the way our body gets a better grip when immersed in a slippery environment. Our wrinkly fingers improve our grip on submerged or wet objects. Also, they channel water away in a similar way to the rain treads on car tires. When you eat something really sour, 
you just don't feel it on your tongue. Sometimes your entire face contracts, so everyone around can see that you don't like the food you're eating. That specific sour flavor that causes this reaction is the result of the hydrogen ions that acids release when they mix with saliva. Yes, that's a mouthful of science. At the moment when your mouth detects this sign of an acid, it sends you a message in a pretty dramatic way so you can't ignore it. It's an evolutionary response that made sense in the old times, because many of the plants that our ancestors found in nature and later wanted to consume were poisonous, especially plants with sour flavors. So even today, your taste receptors light up and your face twists in a way that is out of your control when you taste something like that. Like this. A lighter color on an airplane is actually heavier than darker paint. The color white requires a higher solid content than black to get the necessary saturation. And the higher the solid content is, the heavier the paint is going to be. Which is why white paint is one of the heaviest. But white planes are more efficient than black ones, although this also depends on how you define efficient. The white paint reflects more sunlight than the dark one. Different colors absorb different wavelengths of light, and white objects heat up more slowly compared to darker ones. This results in a cooler interior, which is why it's easier for the entire plane to remain cool. If your hot tea tastes odd when you drink it out of a plastic cup, don't worry, it's not just you. You might imagine that the tea is dissolving something from the plastic, but this most likely isn't the case. The taste you perceive is not just the action of your taste buds. All senses are contributing here. That's why strawberry mousse has a sweeter taste on a white plate than on a black one. And you get the feeling chips are crunchier when you hear those specific higher frequency sounds as you eat them. Also, hot chocolate has a better taste when you drink it from an orange cup. We are kind of conditioned to drink hot tea from ceramic cups, which is why seeing it in a plastic cup subconsciously makes us expect vending machine tea that won't taste good. Flamingos often stand on one leg, and one theory says that's because it helps them conserve body heat. One piece of evidence for that is that they tuck one leg up more often in water than on land. Others believe this is how they save energy, not heat. These birds are definitely more stable on one leg when it comes to standing for long periods of time. That's because they can lock the tendons and ligaments in their legs in a stable position which means their muscles don't have to work hard to stay in one place. Plus, it's actually a classic look, don't you think? Why do repetitive noises annoy us so much? It's simple. They're constantly attracting our attention so we can't focus on other things. We stop reacting to certain repetitive sounds like ticking clocks really quickly. But some are just too annoying, like a slowly dripping faucet. The reason why this bothers us so much is the lack of control. When you know you can stop the noise anytime you want, you won't find it that annoying. Why do all planets make circles around the sun in the same direction? It would be cool to go back 4.6 billion years. You'd be able to see that space wasn't empty back then, even though our solar system wasn't formed yet. There was a cloud of dust and gas in a place where, today, our sun and the planets are. This cloud was like a solar nebula, and it molded our solar system. Generally speaking, a nebula is a huge cloud of gas and dust that occupies the space between stars and helps form new ones, together with the planets that orbit them. When this nebula collapsed, its center became our sun, while the rest of the matter got together and created the planets we know today together with their moons and the rest of the rocky bodies like asteroids. The matter was quickly rotating, and the process looked a bit like cheese dough flattening into a disk that was getting bigger and bigger. Since the cloud was moving in a certain direction to begin with, all of the planets retain the same orbital plane too. Something massive needs to happen to alter a planet's orbit and force it to go in the opposite direction around the sun. Why do some people have such a good singing range? There are three things that can affect the general range of sounds coming out of your mouth. The strength of your diaphragm, the size of your vocal folds, and the shape of the chambers in your sinuses. But making the sound beautiful is largely a question of practice. Practice? Yep. At the basic level, you hear a note and reproduce it with your voice. 
But the true difference between being able to just hold a tune and having a lovely singing voice is related to the thousands of small muscle contractions that are mostly unconscious. They adjust your muscle mechanism where you produce a voice with the emotions you have while singing. Like with other musical instruments, a wider finger span can help you while playing the piano. But the rest is learning those subtle things like pressure on the keys and timing. Now, why do dogs hear higher pitches than us? Humans hear frequencies up to approximately 20 kilohertz and dogs up to 45 kilohertz. Nearly all mammals can hear higher frequencies than other vertebrates. Birds hear up to 12 kilohertz and reptiles, amphibians, and fish up to 5 kilohertz. Mammals don't need to hear high frequencies to communicate with each other, but so they can locate where a certain sound is coming from. The special way of hearing that mammals use, binaural spectral difference cueing, works in a way that our brain compares the frequency range of a sound as it gets to each ear. Head shadows one ear, so some of the frequencies get absorbed, and our brain absorbs higher frequencies more than lower ones. And the smaller the head, the less effect it has on lower frequency sounds. That's why the animal must be able to hear high frequencies to hear a wider spectrum of sounds. A mouse needs to hear up to 90 kHz, and an elephant is fine with just 10. Dogs have smaller heads than us, so they're in the middle category. Why are oceans salty? Well, chemically speaking, salt is sodium chloride. And the salt in the ocean isn't just these two, but many other ions like calcium and magnesium. Most of these start out like rocks on land. Certain things like wind and rain erode these rocks, which basically means they gradually wear them away. So we can say most of the salt in the ocean comes from rocks. Minerals from these rocks leach into streams and rivers. They carry the salt away into the ocean. About 85% of the ions in the ocean are sodium and chloride, while magnesium and sulfate make up around 10%. And some of the salt that ends up in the ocean doesn't stay there. Animals consume a lot of it. But because of a steady supply of runoff from the surface, levels of salinity are pretty much constant. The ocean also gets its salt from one more source – hydrothermic fluids. Magma coming from behind the Earth's crust heats up deep sea vents. When they get hot enough, they lead to chemical reactions between the seawater and all the minerals from the rocks around the vents. That's why every part of the ocean is salty, but the level of salinity depends on where in the world you are. So, take that with a grain of… you know. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the brain.